Well, good morning. Welcome to Faithway Baptist Church today. It's good to have you here on St. Patrick's Day of all days. You know, it's, uh, if you've ever studied his life, he was quite the missionary. I know the Catholic Church likes to claim him, but he really was very Baptistic in the way that he was uh, spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And um, a very interesting life. And so thankful for his heritage and all that he accomplished. But the Bible tells us that Jesus did so much more than any human being could ever do because he was the Son of God. I love how sec- uh, First Chronicles chapter 29 Right when Solomon is dedicating the brand new temple to God, he prays this amazing prayer. He says, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. That's what the Bible says about our God, who he really is, and all that he is, everything belongs to Jesus Christ. And so this morning, we're going to sing about the mighty power of God. Hopefully that's a song that you know well. We haven't sang it in a few weeks, so we're going to sing it out here at Faithway this morning. All three verses, number 11 in your hymn book, if you want to grab one sitting near you, or the words will be on the screen. Let's sing together, I sing the mighty power of God. Let's stand to our feet and lift our voices this morning. I sing the mighty power of God. Deuteronomy 31.8 says, And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee. Neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Those are some amazing promises from God himself. And let's sing about that with our next song, which is not in your hymnal there, but we've done it many times. Our God will go before us.
Now, Phil, I want to introduce the next song here, if I can, for just sure. a moment. All right. We, we were sitting down. But could you go back real quickly, Caroline? So we sit down on a, usually Wednesday, and we plan out the order of service. And notice the last phrase there, his grace will bring us home. And Phil and I were talking about that and what heaven is all about, and we're trying to kind of make that the theme of the service this morning, ultimately where we end up. And a song that came to my mind instantly was a song I sang as a boy every single night. My dad and mom figured out a way to trick us to going to bed. We would sing, we're marching to Zion, and we would all just start marching down the hallway. And before we knew it, we were in our bedroom and we were, yeah, it, it, they would trick us. And so we would just, it was a nightly ritual, we would march to Zion. Now, I'm going to ask you, how many of you have ever sang this song before, we're marching to Zion? All right, some of you have. It's a newer song, but it was written, not newer, newer to you, but it was written many, many, many years ago, old hymn of the faith. And it's one of those songs, it's just one of those classics, we're marching to Zion. So follow along if you don't know the tune. If you know it, please sing up, because not too many people here are familiar with it. But the song is so true about heaven, and we're marching there. Not marching to bed, Phil. We're marching to Zion, aren't we? That's right. <laughs> Later this afternoon, that's right. We're marching to Zion. Come we that love the Lord, and let your joys be known. Father, we thank you so much that we have a city to look forward to, the city of heaven, the eternal place where no more sickness, no more pain, no more death, no more sorrow. And Lord, we long for that day, but as we are marching towards heaven, I pray that you would help us to grow closer to Jesus Christ. And I know being in church this morning is a big part of that, encouraging each other in the Lord and being able to hear the word of God preached and singing together as one big family and, and towards the, our songs directed towards you in heaven. We thank you for Jesus Christ and all that he's done for us. We pray this in his name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, many of you know uh, we, we love our missionaries here at Faithway, and we have a couple different things we've done over the past several months. We have two big offerings uh, that we've been asking our church family to pray about. Last October, we were able to raise over $25,000 to help Paul and Sarah Johnson purchase some land. I'm sorry, uh, they're, the building that we're in, which comes with the land, but it's in the city of Aomori, Japan. And we have, this year we started, we actually asked you to pray about raising some money for a missionary in Aruba. It was an opportunity to purchase about an acre of land. And uh, I think our church has given over $5,000 to date for that. So please keep praying about it. I believe the, the money is due on April 1st, and there's still about $100,000 short. So please be praying for the uh, shields in Aruba. But I asked Paul if he wouldn't mind sending out a quick video update showing us what's going on there and kind of their plans there in Amori. And I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that they are looking for some help towards the end of 2024, maybe early 2025. 
and they're still working out the finalizing the dates for that. But if you're interested in going and doing some plumbing and or electrical, um, there is definitely going to be a need for a few guys to go over there and help with the rough-ins um, in the new part of the building. And Paul's going to show us that here in just a moment. So real short video, a couple minutes long, and you'll be able to get a good idea of what's going on in Amori, Japan, where the money that we gave uh, to help with the building project, where that went to, and what the Lord is doing right now in Japan. Hey everybody, this is Paul Johnson over here in Aomori, Japan. I just wanted to uh, take a quick video tonight and uh, just share some things that are going on in our ministry. Um, a lot of people ask, what does a missionary do? Uh, it's Sunday night over here. This morning I was in a suit and tie preaching and singing specials and uh, doing the church service. some drywall finishing and uh, it's a wide range of uh, a lot of different kind of work that we're doing this year especially uh, but just as a forewarning if you are a drywall finisher you may want to look away for this next clip because it may be painful uh, but as you can see uh, we are uh, in the renovation stages of uh, the building that we were able to purchase last year and a large part of that was due to your sacrifices and uh, support and being able to purchase this building and um, we have a lot of work planned for this year uh, we just finished uh, the design for the, the building with the architect and being able to move forward uh, with the both renovation and then we're going to be doing some new construction Lord willing later this year and so a very exciting year for us um, and uh, as you can see uh, we can use some help though uh, we have a lot of work to do and uh, if you would uh, like to join us getting this building ready for use and uh, getting it back to where it needs to be, uh, please let me know. Uh, we'd love to be able to join together and, uh, and work and uh, just have a great time of fellowship while also getting some hands-on construction work done and uh, uh, just seeing what the Lord can do uh, throughout this year. And uh, I just want to say thank you so much for your support and uh, allowing us to be here and serving as your missionaries in Japan. Right, so if you uh, need any drywall work done when Paul and Sarah come back in a few years, let me know. I'll put you on the list. They can get that done for you. But you know, as a missionary, you're a jack of all trades, and you really have to know how to do a lot of stuff. But as Paul had mentioned to me earlier, there's some things he's not very proficient in, which is if God has gifted you in the area of electrical, I know we have a couple master electricians here in our church, or if you're good at plumbing, uh, he could certainly use the help. And we'll get those dates to our church family here in the next few weeks as they finalize all of that. The end of the service today will give you some announcements about things that are upcoming, but as you know, Easter, Palm Sunday are right around the corner. Great opportunities to invite people to church. Um, if you have not picked up the book, The Case for Easter, yet, uh, there are two left, and they're out there on the book nook out there in the hallway. Please grab one of those copies, and we want them gone today, so that way you can read it, and then give it to someone who may be a skeptic or an atheist, maybe non-believer, they haven't been in church for a long time. It's a, it's a case for... Uh, as it's called, it's called a case for Easter. It, it really is a synopsis of why the resurrection did indeed take place, and it proves it from a scientific, historical standpoint. So please pick up that book. There's two left. Give it to a skeptic. Invite them to church on Sunday morning. It would be great. The gospel will be preached. Speaking of the gospel, it wouldn't be possible without the grace of God. And God's grace is what saves us. God's grace is what keeps us going as we serve him. And that is the theme of the song that Jill's going to sing for us at this time, God's Grace. And uh, she's going to sing, and then children, you'll be dismissed for Children's Church as soon as she is done. my way but then when I bow to you the challenges you guide me through your promises are ever new I claim them for today your will cannot lead me where your grace will not keep me Hand will protect. 
Thank you very much. Well, today's a special day, two reasons why. It was 18 years ago that uh, the Lord allowed us to have our first service here at Faithway Baptist Church, and uh, to God be the glory, great things he hath done. I'm not big on celebrating the anniversaries per se, unless it's like 15 or 20, so in a couple of years we'll have a big 20th birthday party, uh, but it was about 18 years ago, Miss Gigi, that you were born, right? Today's your birthday. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, but happy birthday to Miss Gigi over here. Make sure you sell her afterwards. Happy birthday. And it's good to have your daughter with us today, too. Donna, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And we are thankful for your presence and uh, your gift that God's given to you to be able to sing and bless the church family. And so it's good to have you here. Happy birthday to you. All right, children through the age of fourth grade, you're dismissed through those back doors for Children's Church with Miss Emma and Mrs. Abbott. And we also have our Tiny Tots class for the children ages 2 to 4 that meets throughout the entire service. Uh, that's out there, the first room. And so if you want to drop your kids off for that or you want to keep your children with you, that's fine as well. The Bibles this morning, if you have them, please take it and turn to the book of Titus. The book of Titus. By the way, can I just say, I hope you bring a copy of God's Word with you to church. I know some of you say, well, I got my smartphone with me or I got my iPad or I got whatever. I get it. I understand. One of the reasons why I would discourage you not to, or encourage you not to use that, discourage the use of an electronic Bible, is because I know that when I'm sitting listening to preaching and I'm using my phone as a Bible, I'll get a text message or I'll get a ding from ESPN or something else will hop and pop up on my phone. And before I know it, I've completely lost my train of thought. And so I'm not trying to be legalistic and say, when you come to church, put your phone in airplane mode um, and you know, pay attention to the word of God. But I would encourage you to do that because you're giving up an hour of your time on a Sunday morning to be in the house of God. And uh, you know, I certainly want it to be as profitable for you as it can possibly be. So if you don't have a copy of God's word, please let me know. I would love to give you a Bible. And uh, so I have several that we have here at the church's bought that we like to give to people who don't have a Bible. And so if you use an iPhone, that's fine too. It's just one of those things that I use it sometimes if I'm in a, a pinch. I don't have my Bible. I get it. I understand all that. But let me just encourage you as a pastor to have a copy of God's Word if you can. And if you have your Bible and you turn to the book of Titus, it's very interesting how Paul was writing this letter. And he wrote a lot of letters, by the way. We call them the epistles. And whenever you have a letter that was written by one of the apostles, we call it an epistle. All right, that's just what it's called. Um, and a letter back in Bible days, the letter that you hold in your lap today, the book of Titus, was written to a guy named Titus, who was the head pastor of the churches there in Crete. Now, Paul left Titus on a party island. It was a very wild, crazy place. People were lazy, they were fat, they were gluttonous, they didn't want to work, they didn't want to do anything. They just basically said, let me just be entertained and uh, let the government take care of feeding me. Now, it sounds a lot like our culture today, doesn't it? I don't want to work. If I can work as little as possible and let every, someone else support me, then so be it. And last week, if you were with us on Sunday morning, we talked about how our culture 
is terrified of getting older. I mean, people, we talk about like a midlife crisis for guys. You know, you turn 50 or 55, whatever it is, and someone shows up, shows up at church, brand new convertible, or something along those lines, or Phil goes out and buy a whole bunch of guns. I don't know what you do, but you do, you know, you go out and you, you want to be young again, and so you go through this process of being afraid of getting old. Now, we established last week, and I think you understand this from a biblical perspective, if you are a Christian, being old is nothing to fear. In fact, you shouldn't resist being old. You should welcome it because the Bible tells us the older you get, there's a whole lot more advantages when it comes to life. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse number 31, the Bible venerates gray hair. God says if you have gray hair, it's tantamount to wisdom is what Solomon said. For those who walk with God, their gray head is a crown of glory. At the same time, though, the Bible challenges us for those people who are aged, who have years of experience under their belt, it challenges us to maximize our experiences and your trial-tested faith. We live in a culture today, just like Crete, that refuses to act its age. How much money do people spend on Botox and all of the other things cosmetically to try to look and stay and feel young? In a culture that refuses to act its age, you're about to discover this morning from Titus chapter 2 what the Bible commands us to do when it says to act our age. I find it very fascinating that the Apostle Paul, do you remember the biggest problem that was facing the island of Crete? We talked about this a few, a few weeks ago when we introduced this book. There were false teachers that were going around to all these little churches that had been started. And they were telling Titus and they were telling the people in these churches that they needed to work in order to be saved. And then we get to Titus chapter 3 and verse number 5, and the Bible says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. So the big problem in the church was false teachers. And Titus, you're to go and you're to re re rebuke those false teachers. But I find it fascinating that Paul's solution to false teachers in the church on the island of Crete was not only sending Titus to these churches to put qualified pastors in place, but... He's going to, in chapter number two, address the entire church family and give everybody in the church a special assignment. Now, as a kid growing up, whenever my dad or my mom would say, it's time for a family meeting, we would always kind of just roll our eyes. Oh, boy, what did we do this time? Or what do my parents want me to do this time? Like, it was one of the, either, one of the, either we're in trouble or we're about to get told to clean out the basement or do something, right? Family meeting time. And my kids probably do the same. They roll their eyes when I say it's time to have a family meeting. Well, why do I have a family? We had two family meetings this week with my kids. Why do we have a family meeting? Because there's an agenda that we want to communicate to everybody in the family to make sure everybody knows that we do fill in the blank, right? We turn off the ceiling fans. My dad used to yell at us all the time for leaving the lights on. And, yeah. So family meeting to establish the rules of the house, whatever they might be. Now you laugh about that because you probably have been a part of a family meeting before in your life, maybe not. But you know, it's one of those things as a church, every once in a while we'll have an annual Faithway budget meeting, a family meeting, when special events or things happen in the church that we need to address certain situations. We'll have a Faithway family meeting where we gather together as a congregation and we share what's going on and what's going on in our hearts. Well, Paul is going to give everybody in the church family there in Crete, he's going to give them a special assignment. And the assignment is going to come based upon your age and your station in life. So what we're going to see this morning in, in second, uh, sorry, Titus chapter 2, verse number 1 and verse number 2, is Paul is going to address the older men in the church. Say, well, I'm not an old person here today. I'm not an older man here today, so I don't have to listen. No, my friend, please understand. This is a family meeting, and everybody is going to have to listen to what's going on because it's very it'll help you in your life as well. Like Isaac needs to know what Emma's responsibility is, so she can, you know, so he can correct Emma when she doesn't do what's right, right? So we we, we need to listen to what's going on. Everyone needs to understand. And I say listen because just because you may not be an aged old man like what Paul talks about here, here this morning. There's some truth here that every single Christian can glean because Paul is going to talk about what a mature Christian looks like. And you don't have to wait until you're 50 or 60 to be a mature Christian. I have met teenagers that are mature Christians, far more mature than some 60, 70-year-old adults that I know. And so as a mature believer, as a believer who hopes to grow in his faith with God, here are some lessons that the Apostle Paul commands for the church 
But specifically this morning, this family meeting, the first one that he's going to address is the older men in the church. Turn with me, Titus chapter 2, and look at verse number 1. Paul wrote this, Titus, right, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. The aged men be grave, sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. Now, when Paul wrote the letter that you hold in your lap, right, there were no chapter divisions, as you see, I said, turn to chapter 2 and verse number 1. Well, if, if you don't know where Titus is in your Bible, a little bit of a cheat here, you can turn to the front and there's an index. And we'll say right, right in the very beginning, the books of the Bible, the contents there, and you can find out what page Titus is on. Then you turn to Titus, and then I say chapter 2, well, you look for big heading number 2 and then verse number 1. It's pretty easy to find the verses, because 400 years after these letters were written, the church went about and systematically inserted the verses and the chapters into the books of the Bible, which is generally very helpful, and they usually did a very good job. But every once in a while, it interrupts the chain of thought. And that's what happened here between Titus chapter 1 and Titus chapter number 2. If you look at how Paul opens up in verse number chapter 2, verse 1, he says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Before he gets to that, in chapter 1, look at verse number 16, he says this, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. So he's talking about the false teachers. He's saying they're out there and they're trying to get into the church. Okay, what's the solution? But speak thou. Now the way that that is written, the old King James English, I don't think we walk around saying thou and thee anymore, but the way that that is written is very specific. It's an it's a, um, emphatic you. You speak doctrine that is sound. So Titus, when you get up in the pulpit and you preach, you better make sure that what's coming out of your mouth honors the Lord. The word sound there in the uh, Greek is where we get our English word hygiene from or hygienic. So if you're going <laughs> to preach the gospel, Titus, you better make sure what you're preaching it is, it is hygienic, that it's clean, that it is the pure gospel. Now, you may have heard that term gospel before. Gospel simply means the good news. You say, well, what is the good news? Before I can tell you the good news, i got to tell you the bad news. Revelation chapter 21 and verse number 8 says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's the bad news. Romans chapter 1 tells us that the world is filled with sin. In Romans chapter 3, it says, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23 says, the wages of sin is death. So I always knew the Bible was a doom and gloom book. Yeah, yes, it is, but there's good news, and that's the gospel. And that's what Titus, you're supposed to preach pure gospel truth. What is the gospel? Even though you're a sinner, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The good news is that God demonstrated or commendeth is the word we have in the Bible. He demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, coming up in a couple, I think it's next week, March Madness starts. I, I'm kind of a, a closet um, college basketball fan. Last night I watched my UConn Huskies clinch the Big East Tournament Championship, and they haven't done that since 2011. It was a pretty cool sight, a pretty cool game to watch. And, you know, as you play, I, I was never good at basketball, but I enjoy watching the game of basketball. And these guys just run back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, all game long. And after, oh, maybe playing about 10 minutes or so, the guys get a little winded. They look at the coach and make eye contact with him. The coach taps one of the guys on the bench, and he basically says, you're up. The guy goes out, sits in center court, waits till the next whistle is blown, and then they trade places. They substitute for each other. That's what God did for you. Even though you were a sinner who was destined to the lake of fire, the Bible says that God loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus Christ to be a substitute for you in your place. Jesus bore the wrath of God and he died for your sins so you don't have to. And the Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The only thing that you have to do to go to heaven, you don't have to go to church you don't have to drop a million dollars in the offering plate, otherwise we'd all be in trouble, right? You don't have to do any of that to go to heaven. The only thing that you have to do to go to heaven is the Bible says, repent of your sins and believe in God, have faith in Jesus Christ, and you can be saved. If there's never been a time in your life when that great transaction has taken place, 
When Jesus Christ has become your substitute, my friend, I can think of no better day than today than to put your faith and trust in him. You do not know what the day will bring forth. There was an old preacher that used to say to his preacher boys, he would say, men, when you stand in front of your congregation this Sunday, he was talking to young, young guys that were being trained for the ministry, when you stand before your young men, your, your church this Sunday, he said, you preach as a dying man to dying men because you do not know if this will be the last sermon that you ever preach or the last sermon that they will ever hear. And we like to think that we're going to be around for a long time, don't we? We like to think that we're going to be many, many more years on planet Earth, but we do not know what tomorrow will bring forth. And so if you're playing games with God and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior and repented of your sin, then my friend, the pure gospel today says, call upon the Lord and you can be saved. That's what Titus is saying, Paul says to Titus, you preach sound doctrine, which goes to tell you, if Paul has to tell Titus to do it, there were people in the church who weren't preaching sound doctrine. And, and then it's interesting, as I mentioned earlier, okay, that's the pure gospel. Paul says, Titus, I want you to go around and I want you to preach the truth, but I want you to teach the church to do something. And he doesn't say, I want you to test the church and give them a pop quiz on their knowledge of Bible doctrine. No, I don't want you to tell them what they should believe. I want you to tell them how they ought to live. And that's what we're going to see here in Titus chapter number two, the Faithway family meeting that we're going to talk about here in a world that has gone crazy, and Leesburg certainly has gone crazy, right? What we need is stable, godly people who will preach the word of God in truth. First of all, I want you to see this as we begin. Kind of an overarching statement of where we're at today over the next few weeks. This is this. All believers are to reflect the glory or God's grace to the world regardless of your gender or age because this is what a godless world needs to see. I hope that makes sense to you today. It doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. There is no excuse. All of us are to reflect God's grace, as Jill sang about this morning. God's infinite grace that saved us. Grace that exceeds our guilt and our sin. That's the grace that we are to reflect. And then Paul is going to say, okay, I'm going to break the church down into several different groups of people. And I'm going to address them in this Faithway family meeting. And I'm going to tell them the way that they ought to be living. Why is living for God so important? Because people may hear you preach but they probably won't believe the words that come out of your mouth until you live in front of them the glory and the grace of Jesus Christ. And so by living a, a life that is filled with God's grace and magnifying God, you're magnifying the gospel of Jesus Christ. So older men, Paul says here that you are to be sober. Now, we see here it says there in verse number two, the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and in patience. Now, who is he talking to? Is the aged men. Who are they? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a word that is used in the Greek several times to refer to people who are 50 years and older. So if that's where you find yourself this morning, if you are over the age of 50, or if you've passed the age of 50, um, you're an old man. I didn't call you that. The Bible calls you that, okay? But, but don't be upset if I call you that old, you're an old man today because there's some advantages that come along with it all right what does the bible say well first of all it says to the older aged men you're to be sober um it's very interesting here the word sober is first described is, is used it originally means to to be unmixed with wine all right so someone that is not under the influence of alcohol is considered to be sober uh, the word later came to be used of a person who was overindulgent or careless one commentator added this word also came to describe a man who is free from the excesses of sin, whether it's destructive things like drugs or alcohol or pornography. This is a sober man, someone that is not, um, the vices of this world do not have a grip on him. Now, Paul has already defined the Cretans as dirty old men. That's what he called them in chapter 1, verse number 15. Their minds and their consciences were defiled. And so, as you're looking at these old men on the island that are dirty old men, you know what that word means, right? You think about that, oh, creepy old guys. Paul says, when we have a church meeting, when people come to Faithway Baptist Church, it ought not be filled with people that are dirty old men. What does a godly man look like? Well, the Apostle Paul says here, if you're over the age of 50, what does a godly young man mean, or godly old man look like? He's number one, sober. 
Are you sober this morning? Do things of this world have a grip on your life? You say, well, I'm not over 50. All right, well, you're going to get to 50 one day. So as you're preparing to get to the age of 50 and beyond, are there things, sins of this world, that have you in a grip, in a bind? I was talking to a friend this week about some choices that he's made in his life, and we were going back and forth, and he said, you remember the saying that you used to say in church? Sin will take you farther than you want to go, it'll cost you more than you want to pay, and it'll hold you longer than you ever want to stay. I nodded my head, said, I wish I had listened to that, he told me. Why? Because sin will ruin your life. All right, say, how do I know if I'm an old guy? Well, I read somewhere that you know you're getting old when you recognize that all the music that is being played on the elevator and you can sing along. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but, you know, why you came walking in this morning with a rayon shirt. When I was in elementary school, I had a rayon shirt that I used to wear. So you know you're getting old when you've owned clothes that you, you, the clothes you own go back so long that they're coming back in style. You know you're getting there, right? Getting close to getting old again. And so I'm just waiting for baggy jeans to come back. That, that's when I was a teenager. I mean, are they coming back yet? I don't know. So hopefully not. Those were pretty cringeworthy. But anyways, are you old? If you are, if you consider yourself to be old, or if the Bible defines you as that, then are you sober in your life? Number two, the Bible says that this older man in the church is to be grave or is to be dignified. The word there, grave, means to be worthy of respect. Now, sometimes we think about a grave person as someone that walks around, never smiles, looks like they're, you know, fucking a woman, you know. That, that's not the idea here. This is not a guy who, who is a killjoy, who would never laugh, who would never have fun, no far from it. However, it means that this is not a person who laughs at the wrong thing. Dirty innuendos, dirty jokes, vulgar jokes, suffering of another person, or the suffering of an animal, right? You, you know someone that's cruel, just beats animals just because they think it's fun? That, that's not this type of a person. The Cretan men, remember, were adolescents. In their behavior, they may have been old, but the way they acted were like teenagers. What is an adolescent? Well, I hate to say this this morning, but many times as teenagers, I know we have some mature teens here, but as a teenager, maybe in your early 20s, it's someone who lives for himself and for his pleasures. By the way, one of the greatest way to get out of, out of adolescence is to get married and have kids. Because when your baby is thrown up at 2 a.m. in the morning, you can't just ignore that baby and focus on your sleep. you got to take care of somebody else, right? It forces you to grow up. And these Christian men, though, they refuse to grow up. And they were adolescents. And Paul says, when you come to the local church, I want the older guys to be an example of what it's like to be sober, not addicted to the things of this world, but also grave. They're not telling bad jokes in the church lobby as they're drinking their coffee. They're, they're laughing about the things of God. They're enjoying each other's company, but they're spending time loving the Lord and loving life together as a church. The Christians didn't want to work, though. They did not want to be the guys that were out there slaving away and working hard. In fact, on the island of Crete, the Bible tells us that these Cretans would rather lie, tell a lie, than work. They refused to accept responsibility and self-sacrifice and work ethic beyond their own comfort. In other words, these 50-year-old plus guys wanted to stay teenagers. And the implication in verse number two is that it's possible for an old man to act like a little boy. And Paul is saying to the Christian... Show your culture what it means to act your age. The cultural ad adolescent is all about his own shallow reflection. What do, we, what do they do? What does an adolescent do? Look at my clothes, right? Look at my toys. Look at my muscles. Look at my money. Look at my house, my condo, my cars, my women, my job. On and on and on and on and on. It's all about me. Look at all my cool stuff. In other words, respect me for what I have. And Paul says, no. We need older men in the church that are worthy of respect, not for what they have, but for who they are. We live in a culture that is so rapidly changing. I don't need to tell you that. You know that to be true. In fact, the Western world is experiencing the same phenomena as, as the United States is. And the data reports that are coming in from France, from Italy, from America, all over the place are so disturbing. I recently finished reading a book. I actually would recommend that you read it. It's called The Death of, a, of, of the Grown-Up. The Death of a Grown-Up is what it's called. And what it does is it goes through and it catalogs over 10 years um, the decline of, of adolescence in America. And whether you're a parent, a teenager, a Christian worker, you work with kids, maybe you're you know, in the ministry of some kind, everyone here today, I highly recommend you read this book. It's not a Christian book, 
but it chronicles what's going on in the world today. One of the statistics that, that is in this book, get this, 46% of, of adult couples in Great Britain regard their parents' houses as their real homes. In Italy, nearly one out of three 30-year-olds never have left their parents' home to begin with. In Italy, uh, in, I think it's on page three of this book, a kind of introduction to it. Um, in Italy, they, they tell the story of this 32-year-old 32 32-year-old man who successfully sued his father for financial assistance. Not because he had a disability, not because he was unemployed, but because he, he couldn't find a job that made him happy. He could have found a job somewhere, but not a job that made him happy. So he went to the courts and sued his dad, and he won. His dad has to financially support him until he finds a job that makes him happy. You know, you look at America. The stats don't get any better. More adults in America between the ages of 18 and 49 watch the Cartoon Network than watch CNN. Now, I don't know if that's a critique on CNN, or I don't know what it is, but that, that just tells you. You get my point, right? The average video gamer, when I was growing up in the 1990s, was 18 years old. Do you know what the average age of the video, average video gamer today is? 30s. The average age is in their 30s. The author of this book, The Death of the Grown-Up, wrote this. Our civilization has a near-religious devotion to perpetual adolescence. Doesn't it? Isn't that so true? And the Apostle Paul, he knew that the solution to the false teachers in the church, the first challenge that he lays out is to the older men to begin to pursue these godly characteristics and to turn around once they've mastered them and mentor and disciple the younger men who've never had a father figure in their life. Older men who are dignified, who are worthy of respect, not because of what they own, but because of who they are. Ladies and gentlemen, if you pursue things in this life, things will fail you every single time. Your car is going to get rusty and fall apart. You're going to fall apart and get rusty. I mean, everything in your life is going to eventually corrode and it's going to fade away. But there are some things in this world that will never fade away. You know what that is? The eternal treasures that you lay up in heaven. You instill the truths that God has taught you in the lives of other people. You make disciples of other people. And you're going to be laying up treasures in heaven where the robbers can't come in and steal it and where rust will not corrupt it. All right, number three we have here. First of all, the Bible says that men in the church are to be sober, they're to be grave, dignified, and then the word is the word temperate. Now, that refers to soundness of mind, and that's something that comes from a self-disciplined lifestyle. I'm not saying that every moment of your day has to be regulated down to the every second but can I just encourage you to have a sort of a schedule in your life? It's a self-disciplined lifestyle. I'm going to get up in the morning. I'm going to start the coffee pot. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to take a shower. I'm going to get out the door. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to go to lunch. I'm going to do these things. But I have a discipline in my life. And part of that discipline includes God, my family, and serving other people. So when God says here that the older men in the church are to be self-disciplined in their lifestyle, it's doing the right thing. Not because someone is breathing down your back or watching you on a camera. It's doing the right thing because it's your passion for Jesus Christ. You get up in the morning and you pray, Lord, I want to think straight. I want to think biblically. Give me wisdom to judge the issues and the problems that come across my desk today through the word of God. And you know, if you have an older man in our church and you have the opportunity to sit down and pick their brain a little bit, you'll begin to very quickly realize that they've lived long enough to see just about everything. They're old enough to know that sin promises more than it can produce. The old men in our church have handled more money to know that it doesn't bring happiness. In fact, they agree with Solomon that it just takes wings like a bird and flies away. Old men have owned enough stuff to know how quickly it gets stored in the attic, right? Older men have seen enough sickness and enough suffering and enough death to know that life is fragile and it's very unpredictable. So older guys in the church, can I just challenge you like the Apostle Paul? Cherish the moment. Relish the moment. You've grown in your discernment and you've grown in your balanced thinking. Take the word of God and instill it in the lives of other people. And finally, you'll notice the end of verse number two. Paul says that these guys are to be sound in faith, in charity, and in patience, in love and in patience. Paul gives there the word sound in faith that describes their personal relationship with Jesus Christ. 
not only are these men that have been saved and baptized and growing in their walk with, or been, you know, they're at one point in their life, they were saved. No, these are guys who are growing in their walk with Jesus Christ. Their, their relationship with Jesus is an ongoing relationship. This is sound in love, right? Sound in faith and in love. The word love there is the word agape. It's a word that means selfless love. It's an affection and a love for people in the, in the church family. You may know them very well. You may not know them much. But when there's a need, your heart says, I want to help in any way that I can. Maybe God's blessed you with finances. I know as you get older, sometimes you have more financial opportunities to give. And you hear about a need in the area or a need in the church. And you open up your checkbook and you're able to write a check because God's blessed you financially. Maybe God's given you the gift of time. And you can go and you can visit that person that is in the hospital or in the rehab facility. And you can go spend time with them. When the younger guys are so busy trying to eke out a living, they don't have the time available. So you're sound in faith, you're sound in agape love, and they're, they're persevering is the last thing there is the word patience. They're committed to pursuing these relationships no matter what. Now, I think every man here at Faithway this morning, if they're a Christian, would say, sign me up. Put me down. I want to grow in my soberness towards God. I want to be grave and dignified. I want to be temperate in my lifestyle. I want my faith and my love and my patience to grow. Yep, put me down for it. Sign me up. But how many people will sign on to the perseverance that is demanded to pursue soundness and purity and faith and love no matter what? How many guys, as soon as the going gets tough, they look for a back door. Oh, my marriage is over. My fam I can't do this. Anymore. I can't handle this. I'm out of here. I can't handle the pressure anymore. God says the last thing that he wants the older men to do as they get older, I, I don't know about you, but I, I find as I get older, and I'm only 41, so I'm not nearly the age of some of you guys here in this room, but I lose patience with people, especially people who are incompetent, right? I, and I find my patience is growing thin. And as I talk to some of the older guys in our church, that's something that the fruit of the Spirit that we all could work on having sometimes in our life. We do not like to have to wait on other people. We don't like it when idiots are in control, right? We, we want, and God says, you need to learn to have patience. How do I learn to have patience? Well, it's the Holy Spirit of God. You know, sometimes people think, well, when I signed up for this Christian thing, I thought the Holy Spirit of God would, would smooth things over as soon as I got saved. No. One of the greatest demonstrations of the spirit of patience was demonstrated by Jesus Christ when he had the opportunity to escape the cross, but he didn't. He endured the cross, despising the shame. You realize Jesus that night in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before he died, he could have gone back to fellowship with God the Father, right? He could have done so. He, he could have avoided satisfying the Father's wrath, he could have gone up to heaven and just forgot all about us here. But no, he persevered. Though he was fully God, he was fully man. And he became the perfect model of what an older man at Faithway Baptist Church ought to be. Now, he was only 33 when he died, but he certainly matured a lot faster than any other human being that ever lived. You want an example of patience, of sobriety, of great what it means to be dignified, of temperance, being sound in faith, love, and patience? Look to Jesus Christ. What the family of God needs and what your family, dads and husbands, need, according to Titus chapter number two, first and foremost, is older men who are in pursuit of Jesus Christ. And Paul, through Titus, says, Titus, I want you to call a family meeting of the church, and I want you to sit everybody down, and the first group of people that I want you to address are the older men of the church. Tell them what they ought to denounce, what they ought to put off in their lives, and tell them what they ought to embrace. Men who've grown old, and at the same time, they've left adolescence behind, and they are now growing up. How can you, as a Christian, make sure that you're doing the same? Paul challenges Titus to have a family meeting. And he says, tell the people in your church to pursue these qualities that are up there on the screen. Pursue this way of lifestyle. If you want to be an old man like this one day, guys, teenagers here today... If you want to be an old man that pleases God when you grow up, when you finally cross that 50 age barrier, whatever that, whenever that is in your life, pursue these qualities of character today. Temperance, dignity, sensibility, soundness in faith, loving your family, wholly committed to serving God and persevering throughout all, all the problems of life. Beloved, we need older men who have discovered 
the nature of what true treasure is all about. True treasure is not the size of your house, the amount of toys that you have in the garage, it's not the amount of cars that you've accumulated. True treasure is that that you've been able to get in your own heart and be able to give it out to other people. There are older men in our church who know what true treasure really is. And you know who I'm talking to this morning. You've been there, done that in life. You've become the true treasure to your family, to your church family, to everyone who knows and has the privilege of knowing you and watching you and following you. You have become that true treasure. And if you're here today and that's you, continue on. We need you. And if you're here this morning and you say, you know, I really don't line up to these seven things or six things here. I've really, I've kind of fallen short. The good news is that God can help you become a vessel that he can use at Faithway Baptist Church. The local church needs you. Our world is crazy. It's arguably as bad as it was in Crete, if not worse. And what we need to do is pray every day like the songwriter wrote, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, and with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary. Are you willing this morning to be a sanctuary, that, or a sanctuary, a vessel that God can use for his glory in the church? Remember, everyone here today has a responsibility to reflect the glory of God. It doesn't matter your gender, it doesn't matter your age. We're going to get to the older women, the younger men, the young ladies. We're going to get to you next couple of weeks. We all have the responsibility to reflect the glory of God in the way that we live our lives. Are you doing that this morning? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that you loved us, that you persevered. Jesus did not give up when he could have got off that cross. He could have called those 10,000 angels to destroy the world and to set him free. But he died alone and he bore the wrath of God so he could become our substitute so we could have heaven as our home. Lord, I pray today that you would help someone here today who does not know you as their savior. They've never put their faith and trust in you. To right now, in the stillness and the quietness of this moment, Confess their sin to you, repent, and call out to you and ask them, ask you to be their savior. Lord, if there's someone here who's never become a Christian, I pray today would be the day of their salvation. And then, Lord, I pray today specifically for the men of Faithway Baptist Church, the young men, the old men, that we would be examples to each other, and examples to a world that so desperately needs Jesus. Lord, may we be different in the way that we live our lives. Father, I thank you for giving older men full of wisdom to Faithway Baptist Church. Lord, I thank, I'm thankful for these guys. And I pray that they would continue to serve you with all of their heart until you call them home to glory. Lord, I pray today, as we just said, that you would make us a sanctuary that's pure and holy, that's tried and true. I'm going to ask Sarah to play the piano for a few moments. And if God has spoken to your heart today, would you take some time to pray? Respond to the Holy Spirit of God today. Whether you're a man or woman, it doesn't matter in the sense that we all have the responsibility to reflect the glory of God. And the attributes that we talked about today for the older men are just as applicable for all the people here this morning, every single person, myself included. And if you find yourself falling short in an area, ask God to give you the strength this morning. To Father, we thank you today for the true treasure of the word of God. And as we have considered today the truths that we find in the Bible, 
pray that we would remember that our treasure is not what we have accumulated, what's in our bank accounts. But our true treasure is the Holy Spirit of God inside of us. Pray that you'd work these things out in our lives, that we would have a church full of people who are ready to serve you, ready to do their part to make an impact on a world that so desperately needs our Savior. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.